I'm Dr. Maureen Mays, and this is a frequently asked questions session. Uh, they're taping it, so they've asked me to go through the whole, all the slides at first and then take questions. So hold on to your questions. I'll be happy to answer them. I think we'll have time because I've made it a fairly short presentation. I know uh, when people come to a session called Frequently Asked Questions, they want to ask their own questions <laughs> if, we do, if we don't cover it. Uh, so this is what we are going to cover. What are the types of scleroderma? Uh, that's always uh, sort of confusing, and it's confusing to physicians as well as to patients, except for those physicians who uh, live and work in scleroderma centers. So that's sort of uh, 101 for us, but for many physicians who don't see many scleroderma patients, who only have perhaps a handful in their practice, it's easy to get the terminology confused. So uh, the other questions, how many people have scleroderma and is the incidence or prevalence increasing? And we'll, we'll talk about that. Are there new therapies for scleroderma? I'm happy to say there are. So if you want to leave now, it's OK. But we'll talk about all the trials. And for those who are interested, uh, how can you participate in a clinical trial? The trials are usually held at scleroderma centers, and they're are now maybe a dozen centers or a little more in the country, so it's easier, but still, if you don't live close enough to one of those centers, it's difficult. And then uh, what you all want to know and what I all want to know is what is known about the cause of scleroderma. So let's go to the first one. Uh, what kinds of scleroderma are there? Well, it's usually divided into two parts localized scleroderma and systemic scleroderma. Localized scleroderma really should be renamed. It should be called morphia. There are many dermatologists who are trying to get that change made. The problem is localized scleroderma is in all the textbooks, so it's difficult to make that change and get it accepted by everyone. But even with morphia, there are different types, and I've got some photos. We're just going to go over them briefly. There's linear morphia on Kudasab, and then there are spots, which is actually the most common form of localized scleroderma or morphia. This is an example of linear morphia, which is really a line of thickened skin. It's usually down one limb, arm, or leg. Uh, and more frequently occurring in children than adults, but still, as you can see from the photo, adults can have it. And this is a, a, a scleroderma on coup de sob, or cut of the saber. It is a thickened skin that is usually starts in the forehead, and uh, it then becomes sort of depressed. This is a photo that one of my patients generously permits me to use in teaching and education sessions. Uh, this started when she was a teenager and was active for a period of time and then became less active. She, uh, the, the question of activity is very important, really, in any form of scleroderma, but particularly in this because this tends to be active for a period of time and then becomes quiescent. If it's quiescent and no longer spreading or extending, there's no need to treat it, and there's no point in treating it. The question for her was, if it was inactive, would she be able to get some subcutaneous injections of filler material to fill in that area so it would become less prominent? And we watched it for a period of time, and in fact, that was true. Uh, it wasn't active. It didn't need to be treated. Then the most common, uh, uh, these are the morphia spots. And these are individual spots that occur really on any part of the body, rarely on the face. It's the oncudisab that typically affects the face. And this is the, from the rheumatology slide collection. It is uh, the uh, upper leg, the thigh of a person. And you can see that there is an area in the center that is white, that's an old scar, and then a, a rim around it that is reddened, and that is inflamed, and that is the uh, indicator 
of activity, and this individual really has multiple such spots. This is another patient of mine, and can you see the, uh, the, the spot uh, on the side of the foot? It doesn't show up all that well, I think, in this photo, but it looks a little more pale or yellow tinged as opposed to the pink area of the normal skin around it. It is an area of central scarring, a morphia spot. This is the only spot she has. It's not spreading, no red rim. And it was bothersome, uh, and she was very worried about it because her doctor told her she had scleroderma, so she does what most people do. They Google scleroderma, and she thought, oh no, I've got this disease that's going to shorten my lifespan and involve the internal organs. And that's one of the big differences and the main difference between localized scleroderma and systemic. The localized form does not affect internal organs. So if we go back into the difference uh, between localized scleroderma and systemic scleroderma, which is for the most part what everyone uh, who's here at the conference has, although I know we do have people with localized disease or morphia as well, but systemic disease is divided into limited and diffuse for the most part, with some people having a, a condition called sine, which is without skin thickening. So the limited disease is really about 60% of all scleroderma patients, as, whereas the diffuse disease is the remaining 40%, and actually 2 to 3% of people will have scleroderma without skin thickening, which makes it a very difficult condition to diagnose, because if the hallmark of a disease is thick skin, and you don't have thick skin, it is difficult for your doctor to say, well, this is what's going on. And that's where the test for internal organ involvement and the autoantibodies like the ANA, SCL70, that's where those tests really play a key role because that's what permits us to make the diagnosis. And the distinction between limited and diffuse disease is not based on internal organ involvement, it's based on solely on the extent of skin involvement. The uh, diffuse skin involvement invo uh, includes, in addition to hands and forearms, it includes the trunk. The diffuse or the limited skin involvement, the limited scleroderma, only involves the distal um, extremities hand and forearm, doesn't involve the upper arms or thighs or trunk. And the reason we make this distinction is not so much for uh, an individual patient, but really if you're looking at a large number of patients, out of 100 patients with limited disease and 100 patients with diffuse disease, those with diffuse disease are more likely to have internal organ involvement. The people who develop diffuse disease usually have it within the first oh, one to five years of disease. So if the, the scleroderma involvement in terms of the extent of skin thickening has not worsened into diffuse disease by, say, year three or four, it's not going to. You don't, um, when I first see a patient and they have puffy hands and Raynaud's and it's in the, within a few months or maybe a year of disease, I can't say for sure that that's limited or diffuse, but by year two or three, it becomes apparent which one it is. But just, be, uh, just because someone has limited disease doesn't mean that it's going to re uh, not involve the internal organs. So you always, for an individual patient, have to be vigilant about doing tests to see if there's internal organ involvement. And we'll go over that in a little bit. Uh, this is a photo from the rheumatology slide collection from several years ago of someone who has late diffuse scleroderma, and particularly with the hand involvement. This is something that we are hoping with our newer medications we can prevent. This a uh, photo was taken more than 20 years ago, and I think now um, it's hoped that with our new medications we can prevent these contractures and this severity of disease from happening. 
So uh, on to the next question of how many people have scleroderma. Well, if you look at the United States, more people have morphia than have systemic disease. About 200,000 people have morphia, whereas about 100,000, 80 to 100,000 have systemic disease. So all in all, it's about 300,000 people. But what I find is interesting is that the estimates of the frequency vary according to the population, vary according to geographical distribution. In, uh, even in Europe, if you look at southern Europe, the prevalence of scleroderma is about the same as it is here in the United States. As you go north into the Scandinavian countries, the frequency becomes less. So uh, we'll talk about a little what causes scleroderma, but there are certainly genetic features. There are some genes that will increase your risk of developing scleroderma, and perhaps those genes are not as common in Scandinavian populations as they are in more southern European populations. But here in the United States, if you look at people who, are, who have European ancestry, it seems to be a little different as well. So we think it's a combination of that genetic predisposition as well as some, something that you get exposed to in the environment. And it may not be a toxin. It could be a bacteria or a virus that just happens to exist in some populations more frequently than in others. So the next question about frequency, is it changing over time? Uh, so if we can have a little bit of uh, uh, questions for the audience. How many of you think that scleroderma is increasing now more so than 10, 20 years ago? Okay, yeah, and I would bet that's because when you were first diagnosed or your family member, you had never heard the word before. You didn't know what it was, and fortunately you found the foundation, and you started to meet other people with scleroderma, and suddenly it becomes more common in, in your group, in the people that you know, in your friends. Well, certainly the clinic I run, all my patients have scleroderma. So for me, it's sort of 100% of my patient population. But what, uh, the question is, what are the data, looking at epidemiological studies, what are the data comparing the frequency of scleroderma recently versus 20 years ago versus before that? And actually, uh, it does not apparently seem to be increasing. The incidence figures, and incidence is the number of newly diagnosed cases per year. In 1980, it was about 20 new cases per million per year. And in 2000, it was still 20 new cases per patient per, uh, per million uh, per year. So uh, from these, and this covers 20 years, and of course we're now another 20 years ahead, uh, these kinds of studies are difficult, expensive, take a long time, and they may or may not be repeated again. It's somewhat hopeful that if, now that we have this mega data that you can get from electronic medical records and things like Medicare databases, we might be able to have a sense of uh, that change. The problem with that approach is that, uh, and I know because I code things, you can't build these days without putting a code on everyone. Sometimes you put a code which, because you're suspecting the diagnosis, so you do a test, it's not there, and nobody ever goes back to eliminate the code. So there are problems with those coding systems, but nonetheless, they have some value, and we may be able to actually track the number of cases through these bigger databases. So I'm really interested, and I'm sure as you all are, uh, of is it changing? Are there geographic areas even within the United States that has more, um, more cases? And can that give us a clue as to what that exposure was or what the underlying genetics of that population is that can give us a clue to what causes it? <coughs> and the prevalence estimates, as I mentioned, the total number of cases varies fairly widely from 
uh, one country or geographic area to the next. There have been good uh, studies done in Japan that would indicate that perhaps it is a little less common among the Japanese than what we find in the US. There have been no good studies out of China or India, places where it have, of course, huge populations, but their uh, focus on the epidemiology of scleroderma is not very high, so we uh, probably will, be, uh, will not be able to determine the true prevalence and incidence for a long time in some of those regions. Um, and the better the survival, the greater number of patients. So as our new medicines come in, as we're identifying people earlier and making the diagnosis earlier, people survive longer and they accumulate in the population, which is a good thing, so that prevalence estimates can increase, whereas the incidence, the number of new cases, may stay the same. And uh, looking at question number three, current and future therapy. But first of all, let's go take a look through recent history. And by recent history, I mean the, um, uh, the, the time since I have been uh, practicing medicine and interested in the treatment of scleroderma. So these are the multicenter trials for scleroderma from 1995. And actually, it's about through 2010. The first big multicenter trial we did was the penicillamine trial, followed by uh, the, it was a photophoresis trial, a methotrexate trial, something called interferon alpha, uh, relaxin collagen tolerance, TGF beta, a build 2 cyclophosphamide, and, and then the Scott trial. The Scott trial was published now about two years ago and completed two years ago. So what are the results of all of these? Well. The penicillamine trial was the first one we did. We were all very uh, uh, hopeful that it would be positive, and it was remarkably negative. Penicillamine doesn't work. Uh, the photophoresis trial, good rationale, but again, it didn't work. The oral methotrexate trial actually found that it was helpful for skin fibrosis and particularly helpful for the joint aches and pains, the joint inflammation, tendon inflammation that frequently happens in scleroderma. The problem is the benefit wasn't all that great, but if some benefit is better than no benefit. Uh, interferon was negative, relaxin, collagen, TGF beta, bosentan, and finally, 20 years down the line, we have a positive trial. The scleroderma lung study was actually positive. Well, you can imagine that having spent 20 years sort of in the wilderness trying to find something that was effective, and as time goes on, every trial we did was better organized, more defined outcome measures, more investigators at different centers interested in it, larger trials. So we kept getting better and better at getting trials. We just didn't have a drug that worked. And finally, with the cyclophosphamide trial, it, we did have a drug that worked. The problem was it was cyclophosphamide, which is also known as cytoxin, which is a chemotherapy agent, and clearly a lot of side effects. But in the, even in the trial, the good effects outweighed the side effects. So uh, then we went to the Scott trial, and I'll talk a little about that in a few minutes. So let's look at the scleroderma lung studies, because what I mentioned here was scleroderma lung study one, which was cyclophosphamide versus placebo, early lung disease. So we weren't looking at skin involvement as the primary outcome measure, but at lung involvement. And the results was that the cyclophosphamide was superior to the placebo. So that led us to cyclo uh, SLS2. So if cyclophosphamide works, is there a drug that will do the same thing, but will be safer? Uh, so we use mycophenolate as our comparative agent. And it looked like cyclo uh, cyclophosphamide and mycophenolate were helpful, but mycophenolate, as we expected, was safer, fewer side effects. That led us, of course, to SLS3. So we say, fine, we have a drug that's fairly safe. We have a drug that's reasonably effective, 
What if we combine it with something else versus mycophenolate alone? Can we get better results? This is the way that rheumatoid arthritis now is routinely treated. You're on methotrexate and then perhaps a biologic like Remicade or Embrel now, there's half a dozen of them, but you usually combine them and maybe a little bit of low-dose prednisone. And when people are on that combination, they do remarkably better than on either one of the agents alone. So we're trying to do the same thing. This is a currently recruiting, and we're looking for patients with early scleroderma about seven years from the time of onset, not necessarily the time of diagnosis. The time of diagnosis, or diagnosis can be delayed, as I'm sure many of you have found out, one, two, three years or more from really onset, from the time fingers first became puffy, you developed uh, sores on your fingertips, the whole uh, cascade of events that usually occurs in early scleroderma. And in order to get into the trial, uh, you also need to have lung involvement. Not a lot of lung involvement, but at least mild lung involvement because we're trying to keep that lung involvement from getting worse. There is now some evidence that early lung involvement, some of the scar tissue in the lung, can actually improve and be reversed. Not 100 percent, but at least some percent. So that's really something that we're all very interested in because the old dogma is that once you have scar tissue, it is there forever, and it's not going to go away. The skin remodels. Your skin can loosen up again over time. But internal organs don't have the capacity to remodel. That may not be true. So these are the ongoing uh, or planned multicenter scleroderma trials, uh, 2016 to 2018. Uh, as you can see, and I didn't number them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, there are nine trials here. There are three or four more that are uh, in the works in terms of developing protocols. Some of them are looking at skin as the primary outcome measure. So you have to have a fair amount of skin in order to get into the trial. So if it helps, we can see a difference between the placebo group and the uh, treated group. Some of them are looking at lung involvement, so you have to have a little bit of lung involvement in order to get into the trial. And not, uh, so not everyone is a candidate for the trial. Uh, so of those ongoing clinical trials, some of them have completed recruitment and are now in the follow-up and analysis phase. Most of the trials last for a year of treatment because scleroderma tends to slowly worsen over time. And so if you give somebody uh, an agent and follow them for two months, they very well may not be better even if the agent is effective. You have to follow people six months to a year and then see if there is a, a, a big difference between the people who are on placebo and the people who are on the new drug. And one of the nice things about all the newer trials is that you can be on background therapy. So for some of the skin trials, you can be on methotrexate and you can stay on your methotrexate. We then add the new agent or add a, a pill or an injection that looks like the new agent, the placebo. And the same is true for the lung studies. Um, the results of these trials, most of them will be presented at the American College of Rheumatology meetings in, uh, in October, end of October. So at that point, we'll be able to know what the results of these studies have been. And then there are the ones that are currently recruiting. Uh, and you can tell, because I've bolded the titles, it's, all of them have some sort of cute name associated <coughs> with them. Uh, the Linabisum, uh, the Resolve trial, uh, called, it's a cannabinoid, which is a derivative of marijuana, but it is non-psychoactive. So it doesn't make you high or hungry or dreamy or any of those other things. You can still drive a car, it's okay. Uh, the, uh, but it's still considered by the DEA and the FDA as a 
Schedule one drug like morphine and heroin, which is where marijuana is also cataloged. So anyway, it's kind of a big deal to get a permission to um, uh, participate in the trial. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, that, that looks very promising. But we're still recruiting, and uh, the results will be known probably two years from now. There's SLS3 that I mentioned for lung involvement. And in that trial, uh, well, most physicians now are prescribing mycophenolate, also known as Celsept, for lung disease and scleroderma, and that's very appropriate. The problem with being on mycophenolate and being in the trial is that you have to be naive to mycophenolate. You can't have taken mycophenolate within three months of entering the trial or you're, um, uh, you're not considered a candidate. So if, you're doc if you've got lung disease and your doctor says, I think I want to put you on this drug, you may want to contact a center that is participating in the trial, hold off for however long it takes, hopefully a few weeks only, before you can get an appointment to see if you're eligible for the trial. The trial will pay for the mycophenolate and pay for the, uh, uh, in this case, uh, an, a medicine called profenadone. That's the, the trial agent. And then there's the bartoloxone called Catalyst. That's for pulmonary hypertension. So you don't have to have early disease from scleroderma for that. It can be, it has to be within five years of pulmonary hypertension starting, but not five years from the diagnosis of scleroderma. And then uh, Brentuximab Bravos, that is not a pharmacy-sponsored uh, study. That is an NIH-sponsored study, and that is looking at very early uh, and severe skin disease. So uh, in addition to all of these, multiple new studies are being planned. And from my 30-year career in scleroderma and interested in clinical trials, I've never been in a position before where there have been so many clinical trials that we've actually had to say, well, I can't participate in this trial yet because we have these other ones ongoing and we have to make sure we can recruit enough into those trials before I can start doing another clinical trial, which is sort of a difficult but okay position to be in. So uh, we'll go a little bit about the uh, cause of scleroderma, what we know and what we don't know. Um, first of all, I had mentioned that there is a genetic background that is important in scleroderma. But just having this what we call permissive genetic background is not it's sufficient by itself. Unlike diseases like cystic fibrosis, or uh, sickle cell anemia, if you have the gene, you have the disease. Now, this isn't one gene for scleroderma. These are multiple genes. We now up to about 30 genes that increase the susceptibility. But you could have all 30 genes and still not have scleroderma because you have probably lacked exposure to that other thing that actually made the scleroderma express itself, an initiation factor, some sort of external environmental trigger, could be bacterial, could be viral, uh, could be even your own bacteria in the gut. There's some interest that um, we have, I don't know, millions of different types of bacteria in the gut that are absolutely necessary to digest our food, but sometimes there can be an aberrant one, one that is uh, disease causing and in the right situation can actually trigger something like scleroderma. That may also be true for rheumatoid arthritis. A lot of research looking into that, but still uh, the particular initiation factor in scleroderma is unknown. And in fact, there may be many of them, which makes it even more difficult to identify. And then there are unknown persistence factors. So once you get exposed to this trigger that sort of uh, starts the whole cascade of events, are there other things that have to be present in order for you then to progress to full scleroderma? Some people will have 
limited disease. I've even ha have, I have patients who have diffuse disease. From the time it started, they have high skin scores over a period of one to two years. Then it sort of plateaus, and then the skin gets better. They have a little bit of GI disease, a little reflux, but that's it. And five years later, 10 years later, that's still it. Their disease doesn't progress. So what is the difference between that scenario and others who have skin and then GI and then lung and who seem to just add disease involvement and it becomes progressive? Well, we wish we knew, uh, but that would be helpful for diagnosis, for prognosis, and to say, well, this person has responded to this medication. Do we need to treat them lifelong? Can we slowly withdraw the medicine and they'll be okay? Ah, so laboratory research. There uh, is a lot of interest in all of these areas. Genes and gene expression studies. That's what we do in Houston, in my lab, and with my colleague, Dr. Sherman Asasi. Immune modulation. We know that the immune system plays a role because you have autoantibodies. And even when there is a lot of uh, immune manipulation, as in high dose chemotherapy followed by stem cell rescue, so you wipe out all the bad lymphocytes, all the bad immune cells, and you replace it with naive cells, stem cells that have not been trained to be reactive to your own tissue. Even then, in those cases, they don't lose the autoantibodies. And you think, well, they ought to, that's true, but for the most part, people don't. Once you have this autoantibody, you've got it for life. And what is the mechanism of fibrosis? What, causes, what triggers that scar tissue? We know the cells that make collagen, Unfortunately, you need them in order to exist. You can't shut down all collagen-producing cells. So what can we shut down that, uh, those factors that make those quiescent collagen-producing cells activated and stay activated? Every time you cut yourself and you have a little scar, those are fibroblasts, the collagen-producing cells the collagen forms a lattice, the skin grows over it, it's, and then, then the activated fibroblasts go away. In scleroderma, there is no cut, there is not that sort of physical energy, and the, these cells, these fibroblasts, once they become active, they stay active and they don't go away. And what's the mechanism of vascular damage? Because you've got scar tissue, but then you also have something wrong with the blood vessels, and that's what makes, uh, what causes Raynaud's, and uh, what causes the digital ulcers, what causes the um, pulmonary hypertension further on down the line. All of that is a vascular phenomenon, and that's different from the scar tissue. So there is some sort of immune crosstalk. Once the immune system becomes activated, it activates these uh, collagen-producing cells, and it also destroys the uh, vascular, the small vascular cells. There's some sort of link to those two things, and that link is not clear. Uh, so research funded by the foundation, and I won't go over these uh, in general, but the foundation is actually supporting research in all these different areas gene expression studies, immune system, fibrosis, and vascular damage, all of this is very important because at some point, I, I, and I hope uh, fairly shortly, we're going to step back and the big picture is going to become apparent as each person puts in a little bit more of this big puzzle. You know, as you start working a, a, a puzzle, jigsaw puzzle, you don't see the picture initially, but you do a little corner and something in the middle, and then you step back and all of a sudden you see the whole scene. And I think where we are right now is putting together the corners and little bits and pieces here and there. We don't have the big picture. Ah, now, the other thing, do scleroderma researchers talk to each other? And yes, we have several meetings now which is much different than it was even 10 years ago. There's a workshop that happens every two years. 
that brings now five or 600 scleroderma researchers together to talk about basic science. So it's not just, it's three exhausting days of lecture after lecture talking about mouse models and cell cultures and gene expression studies so that the investigators can actually talk to each other and see what they have in common and how they can link these things together. So it was in Pittsburgh last August, and it's going to be in Cambridge, England, which is nice, next August. Uh, and then there's also a clinical meeting, the World Congress, that uh, is going to be in March 2019. And this brings together researchers from around the world who are mostly clinicians doing clinical trials, like uh, much of what I do, who are seeing a lot of sclerodermal patients. And the purpose here is to um, get that interaction going to see if uh, in terms of what is being used to treat patients in various uh, countries, what is successful, what is not successful, and to get like-minded individuals together so they can plan bigger and better clinical trials. <clears throat> 